Sunday of Lent. Lent is that season on the Christian calendar when we start getting ready to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. It's the period of 40 days leading up to Easter when we get ready to celebrate Jesus' victory over the empty tomb. And as a way of helping us understand what that journey was like, a way of visualizing it a bit, you'll notice this candle that we have here. If you'll recall, last Sunday it was over here at the piano. It is going to journey with us through the season of Lent, closer and closer to the cross, and symbolically closer and closer to the cross of Christ and to the empty tomb. Watch for it each week as we move that direction until finally on Good Friday it will be directly in front of the cross during our Good Friday service uh, that Friday night at 7 o'clock before Easter Sunday. Today it is set alongside the Lord's Supper. And as you heard a moment ago in the passage of Scripture uh, that Austin read, this is our focus today. This meal is something that in the life of our church we share in the first Sunday of every month. It's something we do regularly. I don't want to say routinely because sometimes people think that that word means uh, it's somehow less. We do it as part of the routine that shapes our lives. It it, it gives us a sense of uh, of putting in order uh, things that might otherwise seem very disorganized in our lives. So that's our passage of scripture today from Matthew chapter 26. In in addition to the candle, in addition to whatever else we may be doing as individuals or as households to get us ready for Easter, in the life of our church we have a special sermon series throughout the season of Lent. And the series is called Final Instructions. Final Instructions. Jesus' lessons from the upper room, Gethsemane, and the cross. That is to say, we recognize that right before Jesus was about to be handed over, right right before he was about to be arrested and tried, right before he was about to be executed, there were certain things that Jesus was trying to get across to his followers. There were certain lessons that he wanted to leave them with. Some of them were new lessons, like we talked about last Sunday in John's Uh, John's story about the upper room, he remembers Jesus saying, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Jesus had never quite put it just like that right until his final instructions. Other times, Jesus is trying to touch again or uh, emphasize one last time the importance of something that he wants the disciples to have. All three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke, talk about this moment at the end of Jesus' life, where he gathers the disciples together in the upper room and they share in the Passover meal, and then Jesus begins to reinterpret it. He begins to reapply some of those lessons, begins to offer a fresh interpretation. And as a, as a lens, as a way of helping us move into the text and understand it for our own lives, the question that I want to begin with today is this. What are the memories that shape your identity? What are the stories that you have so committed to memory from your past that they shape who you are on a daily, on a regular basis? I'm not talking about just when you get together with with old friends, with loved ones, with family members, and you tell stories on each other to get a laugh. I'm not talking about things that, that just happen once upon a time and somebody might have to remind you of in order for you to be able to recall it. I'm talking about those stories that are almost a daily part of your life. The things that made such an impression upon you that they continue to shape daily who you are and your sense of who you are becoming in Christ. And of those stories that shape your identity, how many of them are tied, connected to a meal, to the breaking of bread, to the sharing of drink? I'll give you some examples. Uh, how many 
of you can remember moments or lessons that were given to you in a kitchen somewhere. As somebody was preparing a meal or setting a table or as you were sitting down together with loved ones. How many lessons came for you when the person that took you fishing sat on a creek bank or a lake shore someplace and tore off half of a folded over peanut butter sandwich and shared a cup of black coffee with you when you were seven years old. My family had a funny one this week. My parents uh, received a package in the mail. It was one of those letter envelopes, big enough for an eight and a half by 11, and it had a piece of cardboard stuck in it so that the photograph inside would not bend. There was a lady in our church when I, the church that I, first church I remember when I was just a little guy, and she always sang in the choir, and she died recently. And as her family was going through some pictures, trying to find some to make one of those video collages that they show at the, at the funeral home now, they ran across a picture of yours truly. So here is this black and white photo, and I assure you I am not so old as to have been required for there to be black and white photography. It was somebody's choice to develop this in black and white. But nevertheless, it is a black and white photograph, eight and a half by 11, I don't know why it's blown up that big, of four-year-old me at Vacation Bible School. And I guess it's break time, snack time or something, because I'm sitting in the middle of this green field, hair just everywhere, and I am holding the international sacred beverage of the Brotherhood of Vacation Bible School, Red Kool-Aid. You know, even as a four-year-old, learning stories of Jesus, learning songs of Jesus for the very first time, I was sharing in a meal that would become part of something that led me just a few years later to say yes to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And just a few years after that to say yes to a calling to gospel ministry. There are all kinds of stories like that and, and you're familiar with them. Some of us went to a ball game the other night and the conversation turned to the place where we ate the pre-game meal the last time we were in town. Coming up this Thursday, the pastors and priests of Georgetown are going to gather for breakfast because that's what preachers do when we get together is we eat. There is something about the breaking of bread within the fellowship of God's church. That is foundational. Is that vitally important? How many of those important memories that shape who you are as an individual on a daily basis are tied to a meal? Is it any wonder then that Jesus gathers his loved ones together for a final meal? the most important meal of the year, the Passover meal for them, and uses that as a jumping off point to teach final lessons to them. That's the context for our story today. This is a wonderful story. It's a wonderful memory. In fact, it is so powerful that if you did not have any other image, if you did not have the image of the cross, if you didn't know the rest of the story, if you didn't know and couldn't visualize an empty tomb, this image, this memory, would be a perfect summary of the life and ministry of Jesus up to this point. Jesus who had the reputation of one who ate a little too much and drank a little too much, and shared meals and shared table fellowship with all the wrong people, tax collectors and, and, and no-gooders. And yet, that's who's there for his final meal. As he's breaking bread, as he's sharing a cup. It's a symbol, it's an emblem of his entire ministry up until now. And it is an amazing the emphasis that he chooses to place on this. Here he is, death knocking on his door, moments away from being betrayed, just hours away from being executed, and he is shaking his fist in the face of the powers that be, shaking his fist at Rome, shaking his fist at the religious authorities, saying, come and get me, but first, would you care for some bread? One last time, it's as if he mocks 
the powers that think they're going to do him in and flips it again instead of fleeing, instead of fortifying himself, instead of barricading himself in a room someplace, he serves dinner. If you didn't know anything else about Jesus, if you didn't know what was coming on the cross, this would be a beautiful image, a memory that would help you understand what the ministry of Jesus was all about. There's another element in which he is preparing his disciples for his death. He's trying to let them know that this is coming and trying to help them visualize not just the past but the future so that they will have some way of being equipped for continuing the movement after he is gone. And so in order to prepare for death, he focuses on the very essence of life. What can speak more of life than flesh and blood? They think they're about to kill me. And again, it is ironic, it is playful, it is bizarre that Jesus chooses to say, they think they're going to kill me, so eat my body, drink my blood. It is strange enough, it is mysterious enough, powerful enough to stick with people and become one of those memories that shapes us day in and day out. But Jesus is also shaping their lives through something he wants them to remember. I I compare it to this. I I had an email this week from one of our deacons, uh, Ray Sexton, uh, serving his second term as a deacon in the life of our church. And Ray's not here today because, once again, Ray has said, Yes, Lord, I will go on international missions. Um, I, I can't even remember all the places and all the times he's gone. I know Tanzania, I think Malta, I'm not sure about that, but this is his second trip in two years to Guatemala. And he sent me a note just as a reminder, Saturday, I'm leaving, I'm going out of of the country, I'm going to serve. And we always make sure that we uh, include in our prayer list anybody that's serving on international missions. And so he knew we'd be praying and he wanted to send a photo. He wanted to send a story so that we know a little bit more of how to pray. And these were the ones that he sent. The first photograph is of a lady named Raina. Raina is a young widow. She has three teenage children living in the home. And when everybody that can work has work, and they have the most productive month possible, and everybody pools their resources at the end of the month, their household income for the month is usually about $80 for the month. Of the houses that Ray will be building this week, Raina's is the only one that has access to electricity and water and drainage. Keep that in mind. The second picture is of a person named Christina. Christina is just a little bit older. She, too, like Raina, is a widow. But unlike Raina, Christina has an adult son living at home with her, and he has developmental disabilities. There are others in the home. She's also raising her two teenage grandchildren. And when everybody in that family who can work does work and pools their resources, they make no more than about $130 a month. This is a household that when Ray and his team are finished building a new place for them, they will have, even with a new place to stay, access to no electricity and no drainage. Keep in mind that all three of these households currently live in a structure that you and I would consider trash. We would not even recognize it if we went past it as a place where a human being was trying to live. Because there are two primary materials uh, in these houses. One material is wood that is left over from old projects, and the other is scrap metal. So however uh, you lean things together and lash them together the best that they can, that's what they do, and then when the rains come and the wind and the house falls apart, they put it all back. Ray is coming in, at least with his team, trying to provide something of a permanent structure. There's a third family. 
Jorge and Amelia. Jorge is not pictured. He's, uh, he's a little bit older, a good bit older than Amelia. And they have four kids at home, ages 13 and under. When everybody in that household who can work does get work and they pool all of their resources, they make about $160 a month. When Ray and his team are finished there, that house, even though it is family land, so it's, uh, it's affordable, this new house will have no water, no electricity, no drainage. Ray sent me that email and sent us these pictures so that we could pray, knowing that a picture is worth a thousand words and a story is worth a thousand pictures. Jesus is trying to do something similar to that, I believe. By the breaking of bread and the sharing of cup, by the sharing of this meal that we call the Last Supper. And he's asking us to remember the bread and the cup as one of those stories that shapes who we are on a daily basis. He's so keen on this point, in fact, that Luke remembers specific instruction. Luke chapter 22, verse 19, as Luke is sharing his version of the upper room story, as he's sharing his version of the Last Supper, he remembers Jesus saying these words, Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And there's a couple of aspects of what it is that we're remembering here. A couple different distinct facets that we're remembering. First one is, when we take this bread and drink of this cup, we are remembering the unique act, the unique action that Jesus and only Jesus could do and did. Only Jesus could go to the cross and have the saving effect that Jesus did. Only the Son of God. Only the only begotten Son of God. God with us. God made flesh. The Word made flesh. Only Jesus uniquely could go to the cross to save us, to redeem us, to show that overwhelming, abundant love, willingness to lay down his life for his friends, willingness to lay his body over a divide as a bridge for us to the Holy One. Only Jesus could uniquely perform that act. And we remember, we remember when we take this bread and drink this cup. But there's a second aspect of what we remember. When we take this bread and drink of this cup, we also remember that you and I are offering our own bodies, our own blood, of joining into the same ministry, the same life that Jesus lived. Do you hear those two distinct purposes, those two distinct parts of this memory? On the one hand, we are remembering when we take this bread and cup that Jesus and only Jesus uniquely could do what was done on the cross and through the empty tomb. But we, all of us, each and every one who is a child of God, a sister and brother in Christ, each one of us is joining in with the same life, the same ministry as that which Jesus lived. And so when the deacons in just a few moments share these elements, as they move throughout this room and serve this congregation, this is what we are saying together. This is what we are saying to one another and to the Holy One. We remember what Jesus uniquely did. And we remember that we are joining in that same life and ministry. Which is why, which is why my life should look different than the life of someone who does not take this meal. Your life, if you receive the bread and the cup, should be so formed and informed and reformed by this memory that you look and act and live and serve and minister differently than those who do not share in it. I should be able to remember who we are in Christ, who you are and who I am in Christ 
if I'm going to be someone who receives this bread and this cup, the body and the blood of Jesus. So last week, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, the first sermon in this Lenten sermon series was about Jesus' teaching in John's gospel, love one another. And we talked about how if we are going to love one another, and today if we're going to be people who share in this bread and in this cup, then we ought to be people who sound different from that mess of what we hear every day on the evening news and in the 24-hour news cycle. That same mess of backwards, destructive communication that we hear from media types and politicians and celebrities and sports figures. We should look and act and sound differently. We should communicate differently than those folks. We talked about two columns. The left-hand column describing what the culture at large is saying to us communication should be like. And we don't have to settle for this. Community, I'm going to try one more time. The culture at large says start by assuming bad. If that other person wears a different political button in November, if that other person has a different set of values, if that other person seems different from you, assume bad and repeat worse. Or accuse worse and repeat the worst. Because if you're operating from that foundational assumption that this other person operates with impure bad motives, then they're capable of God knows what. But we don't have to settle for that. We who receive the body and the blood of Christ, we who receive the bread and the cup are saying we are entering into the same life, the same ministry of Jesus. Even though what he did on the cross was unique, we're joining into that same life. And therefore, we're moving toward this right-hand column of assuming good. You're my sister in Christ. You're my brother in Christ. I'm going to assume that you mean well, even if I don't understand. And if I don't understand, then I'm going to ask for clarification. I'm going to invest in our relationship enough that I'm going to take the time to ask, help me understand. What what did this mean? Uh, What meaning would you like for me to associate with, with this decision? And then finally, I can repeat what we talked about, but only with permission. Because sometimes it's just not my story to tell. Sometimes it's just not my news to share. And if we are those who receive this meal, then we are actively moving away from the habits of the culture at large and praying that the Holy Spirit will make us more and more like Jesus the Christ. Look with me again at verse 29, if you would. I tell you, Jesus says, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you, In my Father's kingdom. Jesus is talking about this meal and is comparing it to something we refer to as the heavenly banquet. There was this idea in the New Testament world that in the next life, in the next place, there will be a beautiful banquet spread. With more and better than what you could ever imagine. A greater sense of joy and fellowship. More to enjoy there than you've ever seen. And Jesus is drawing a a connection between this table, this meal, this banquet, and the one that will be set for the children of God in the next life, in the next place. Jesus is saying those who choose to share in this meal will also share in the next banquet feast. Those who treasure what Jesus uniquely did and those who share in his ministry as well. We will share in that banquet feast that is spread for the faithful in the next place. In closing today, I want to ask you to look with me at the very beginning of this story and the very end of this story one last time. Actually, we're going to look before the beginning and after the end of what we've read thus far. In verse 21... Even before Jesus starts talking about the bread and the cup, in verse 21, Jesus says, One of you will betray me. 
And then after talking about the bread and the cup, at the end of the story, in verse 31, Jesus says, But all of you will desert me. Do you catch that? That Jesus is doing all of this, all of this talk about bread and cup, body and blood, all of this comparison with the heavenly banquet, all of this is within the context of Jesus already knowing. He already knows that Judas will betray him. He already knows that the disciples will all desert him. He already knows that when he's lying, when he's hanging naked on that cross, there'll be nobody left to stand with him. All oh, the night before, there was one standing out by the, by the fire trying to stay warm. And the whole while, Simon Peter was saying, I don't know the man, I don't know the man, I don't know the man. There'll be nobody left but his mama. And a few ladies who love him like their own. And everybody else, he says, verse 21 and verse 31, will either betray him or at least desert him. And yet, he does it anyway. He does it anyway. For you and for me, for all of us, he does it anyway. If you've ever wondered the limits of God's love. You're looking at it. If you've ever wondered if the grace of God can be extended even to somebody like me or even to somebody like you, if you've looked in the mirror or if you've looked in the past and have said there's no possible way that the grace of Jesus Christ can be extended to me, look again. He already knew one would betray him. And all would desert him. And yet, the Son of the living God reached out again. And again. And again. To offer that invitation for anyone who would choose to come. And he offers it again today. Knowing full well that at best I'll desert him. And at worst, I'll betray him. If you don't know that kind of love in your life today, if you do not know what it is to live in fellowship with that kind of God, if you don't know what it's like to stand with a group of people who are being shaped by that type of fellowship, this is our God. And this meal is the visual reminder. It is the memory that we celebrate every month. Reminding us, shaping who we are in Christ, day after day, week after week, and so on. If you've never given your life to the one who goes in knowing how bad it will be, and yet offers his love once again, I want to encourage you this very day, this very moment, to give your life to him. To say yes to the love that he offers. Not just through this meal, through the cross and through the empty tomb. Receive him as Lord and Savior. Accept him as Savior and friend. And let him transform your life. Wipe clean all that mess from your past. Set you free from all that sin that has separated you from the Holy One. Give you a fresh start and form you into something new. Say yes to him and be recreated in his image. Or today, something about this fellowship may have stood out to you. Something about seeing Zach in the waters, thanking the people that have walked with him on this journey. And you realize you need somebody who's got your back. You need somebody who will stand with you and journey with you through whatever life is going to bring towards you and vice versa. And so today you know that you need the fellowship of this church. And you need to be a member together, united with these sisters and brothers in Christ. If today you are making a decision for him, if you're making a decision today to be united with this church, then this next song is for you. It's intended as a time for you to come forward and share that decision. I'll be standing right here to receive you just like I did with Zach. 
And I would love to pray with you and to welcome you into the kingdom of God, into the fellowship of the banquet feast, into the fellowship of this church. However it is that you need to respond to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. We're going to stand now and sing in hopes that you'll come. Our musicians are going to lead us now. Don't let this moment to respond pass you by. You can sing, you can pray, you can praise, you can give your life to Him. You'll learn of ways that you can give and serve in just a few moments. However it is that you need to respond to the work of the Holy One in your life, we stand now and sing in hopes that you'll come.